Welcome back for chapter eight notes. <clears throat> we are now moving into hypothesis testing and chapter 8.1 on um, this lesson is all about learning the pieces to hypothesis testing. So um, what we're going to learn in this lesson is definitions used in hypothesis testing and how to state the null and alternative hypotheses. So a hypothesis is a statement regarding a characteristic of one or more populations. A hypothesis test is a formal process based on sample evidence and probability used to test hypotheses. So we're going to make a statement regarding the nature of the population, what we think is true, and then we're going to collect evidence, so some sample data, and we're going to test the statement. And then we're going to analyze the data to assess the plausibility of the statement. <clears throat> so the actual test begins by considering two hypotheses. They are called the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. Hypothesis. These hypotheses contain opposing viewpoints. The null hypothesis is a statement of no difference between sample means or proportions or no difference between a sample mean or proportion and a population mean or proportion. In other words, the difference equals zero. So we don't think there's any difference. HA, it's called the alternative hypothesis. It is a claim about the population that is contradictory to H0 and what we conclude when we reject H0. So there's three parameters that we can be testing. We can be testing the population mean, mu, the population proportion, p, or the population standard deviation, sigma. We are not going to be testing the standard deviation this semester. We're only going to be focusing on testing the population mean and the population proportion. <clears throat> so there's Besides the parameters that we're going to test, there's three types of tests that we can do, and they are as such. We could have an equal versus greater than, that would be a right-tailed test. We could have an equal versus less than, that would be a left-tailed test, or we could have an equal versus not equal to, and that would be a two-tailed test. <clears throat> so let's see what these might look like. Example one says a medical trial is conducted to test whether or not a new medicine reduces cholesterol by 25%. State the null and alternative hypotheses. So H0, <clears throat> we know that we're testing proportions because we were given a percentage. So we're testing proportions. <clears throat> and we're testing, we think that the proportion is equal to zero because we're assuming that there's no change um, with the medicine. But the trial says that they think the medicine reduces by 25%. So there's going to be a 25% change. That's what we think. <clears throat> okay. Example two active management of labor. AML is a group of interventions designed to help reduce the length of labor and the rate of cesarean deliveries of babies. According to a recent article, the average cost of having a baby in a U.S. hospital is about $2,528. A random sample of 200 AML deliveries had a mean cost of $2,480 with a standard deviation of 766. Do the data provide sufficient evidence to conclude that on average, AML reduces the cost of having a baby in a U.S. hospital? Don't get too worried. The only thing we're pulling out here is we're just figuring out what are they claiming and what are they testing. <clears throat> so we are talking about units of dollars. So that tells us that we're working with means. Okay, so we are testing mu, the mean, and they think that it has been um, equal to Uh, 2528. They think that's what it is equal to. And the AML group believes that um, their, their interventions that they have will reduce it. So they think it's going to be less than 2528. You can just disregard everything from the sample because we only need the sample when we go to have evidence. That's later on in the hypothesis process. But right now we're just stating what we're comparing with what we think is true from historical beliefs, 2,528. Example three <clears throat> says, 
So we want to test whether the mean height of eighth graders is 66 inches. State the null and alternative hypotheses. Okay, so we have the H0 and the HA. And we have a unit, so we know that we're talking about means again. So it's going to be the mu symbol. And so they think that it's equal to 66 inches. And then they're, um, they're proposing, they want to know whether it does actually equal 66. So the, that's going to be a not equal to 66 inches. Example four, on a state driver's test, about 40% pass the test on the first try. We want to test if more than 40% pass on the first try. <clears throat> so H0 and HA. So H0, um, first we have to look, we see percentages. So we're talking about proportions. So my symbol is gonna be P. And they believe it's equal to 40%, or you can write 0 0.40. Um, and then they say they want to see if the test, if more than 40% pass. So that means they, they're proposing that greater than 40%. Okay. According to the National Household Survey of Home Drug Abuse, 13.6% of 18 to 25 year olds in the U.S. were current users of marijuana or hashish, hashish, hashish in 2000. A psychology researcher at a university believes that the proportion of 18 to 25 year olds who are current users of those drugs has changed from the 2000 percentage. They conduct a poll of 1,283 random people in the U.S. in that age group and find that 205 of them currently use those drugs. Do the data provide sufficient evidence to support the researcher's claim? Write the null and alternative hypotheses and symbols. State the type of test. So we don't care anything about the sample, so we don't care about the poll at this point. <clears throat> And they're talking about percentages. They use the word percentage. And so that's why we're talking about proportions in P. And so they believe that this is true, that it's equal to 13.6% currently, currently use those drugs. But there it says, um, a researcher believes that the proportion who are current users of those drugs has changed. So has changed leads me to believe that it's a not equal to, it's a two field. So not equal to 13.6. So after the test, there can be some air that come out of this. There could be um, two airs that we're going to be looking at this semester. One is a type one air and one is a type two air. <clears throat> and we kind of can we can describe them using this table because <clears throat> there could be four outcomes that could happen. So let's say that H0 is actually true, okay, in real life. So this is in real life. And so in real life, H0 could be true, but let's say we don't reject H0. That's a that's a good outcome. It is true and we don't reject it. We could also say that we know that H0 is actually true, but we dis but the court rejects it. That's called a type one error. It also has a symbol of alpha. <clears throat> and then the third um, outcome could be the H0 is actually false and we do not reject H0. And that's called a type two error, that's beta. Give yourself some time to think about these and what they mean. And then we could have the fourth um, outcome where H0 is actually false and they actually do reject H0. So that's a current, a correct outcome. So those, that one's a good one and that one's a good one. Type one error equals the alpha. We've been working with alpha um, in our critical Z values. And so that's gonna also represent the same thing. The alpha that we're allowing to have as a type one error. That's what we wanna allow as alpha. These are the four descriptions that I just went through, if you want to read through them again. Each of the errors occurs with a particular probability. The Greek letters alpha and beta represent these probabilities. So again, alpha is a probability of a type 1 error. 
It's a probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. Okay. And um, beta is a probability of a type 2 error. It's a probability of not rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. Alpha and beta should be as small as possible because they are probabilities of errors. They are rarely zero. <clears throat> They're in a way complements of each other, but not direct complements. Alpha plus beta does not necessarily equal one. Okay, so <clears throat> we can think of the actual is the real life, and then we can think over here is kind of like what the jury says. If you were thinking about somebody going to jail, so this is in real life, the person is innocent, And then um, do not reject a zero means that they <clears throat> did not um, say that they were guilty. And then the rejecting a zero says that they were found guilty. So so a type one error is when the person's really innocent, but they're found guilty. <clears throat> Over here, it could be the person's really guilty. But they are not found guilty. They're, um, I mean, they're they're found innocent. That's not a good thing either. That means we have a criminal out on the streets. So they're they're actually guilty, but they're found innocent. That's the type two um, error. <clears throat> Let's look at a couple of examples here. So. It says, example six here says, according to the null hypothesis, stage zero, if the blood cultures contain no traces of the pathogen, state the type one and type two errors. So the type one error is that there's no, there is no pathogen. But the test says there is. So you really aren't sick with a virus, let's say, but the test comes back that there is <clears throat> the virus. So um, that is not good because then they could give you medicine that you don't need, right? So type 2 error, so this is alpha, this is beta. So the type 2 error is there really is a pathogen, but the test is negative. So for instance, <clears throat> you could really have strep throat where you're actually sick, but the test says negative, and so the doctor doesn't give you any medicine. That would not be good either. Okay, let's look at the next example. So suppose the null hypothesis H0 is a patient is not sick. State the type one and type two errors, which type of error has a greater consequence? So type one error is patient not sick, the doctor says they are and gives medicine. Let's just say that. Type two error is patient not sick. Oops, sorry. Patient is sick. Patient is sick, but doctor says no illness and does not give medicine prescription. Which one is worse? <laughs> so if you're not sick and you are given medicine, it depends on the degree of this, because if it were just uh, 
they gave you some penicillin, but you didn't really need it. It's probably not a big deal that you took some penicillin, right? And if you were sick and they didn't give you medicine, and let's say you, you know, had strep throat and they did not give you medicine, that's that's not good. <clears throat> that would, I think the type two there would be the worst. But let's say it's the other way around. Let's say that you don't have cancer, but the doctor says you do have cancer and they recommend having some dramatic treatment or surgery, then the type two, one error would be worse. Um, because here it's, let's say you were sick, but they didn't give you treatment on cancer. I mean, that could result in death as well. So depending on the severity of the disease definitely changes um, your decision on how dire the uh, type one or type two error is. For example, eight, it says a certain experimental drug claims a cure rate of at least 75% for males with prostate cancer. Describe both the type one and type two errors in context. So, Type one is cure rate greater than or equal to 75%, but research says it is less than 75%. And a type two would be the cure rate is less than 75%, but research says it is greater than 75%. <clears throat> so in this case, um, you're taking a drug, right? So they're saying the drug is, the cure rate is 75%, this is the real in real life, but in reality, it's not. That's not good. You're taking, um, they're maybe not going to say the drug is a good thing, but really, it is a good thing. Type one, type two error says the cure rate is actually less than 75%, but the research is saying that it's bigger than 75%. Um, and that's not good because maybe somebody's taking it and waiting on not doing some kind of other intervention, thinking that this is going to work, but when really it it doesn't work. So again, you kind of have to contemplate on, on that. Example nine says, red tide is a bloom of poison producing algae, a few different species of a class of plankton called dinoflagellates. When the weather and water conditions cause these blooms, shellfish such as clams living in the area develop dangerous levels of a paralysis-inducing toxin. In Massachusetts, the Division of Marine Fisheries monitors levels of the toxin in shellfish by regular sampling of shellfish along the coastline. If the mean level of toxin in clams exceeds 800 micrograms of toxin per kilogram of clam meat in any area, clam harvesting is banned there until the bloom is over and levels of toxin in clams subside. Describe both the type one and type two error in this and state which error has the greater consequence. Okay. So on this one, it would be um, that the toxin level is not too high. So it's less than 800 micrograms. But the test says it is, so they ban harvesting, right? If the test comes back, then they say no harvesting. So that means that the clam industry is going to go down. Now, for the type 2, the toxin level, let's say the toxin level is too high in real life. It's greater than 800 micrograms. Um, and they say it is fine. Then that means the shellfish could have disease, right? So 
So there's both there's both um issues there. I know that there is um red tide red tide also um happens over on the west coast of Florida over by Fort Myers area and can make people very very sick if they breathe in this toxin. So if um if the type 2 air happens, I think that's kind of the worst one because it can get this uh, toxin into the air. Example 10, it says, determine both type 1 and type 2 errors for the following scenario. Assume a no hypothesis H0 that states a percentage of adults with jobs is 88%. Identi identify the type 1 and type 2 errors for these four statements. Not to reject the the null hypothesis that the percentage of adults who have jobs is 88% when that percentage is actually less than 88%. So the age zero is, is equal to 88. So they're not rejecting. So let's go back to our table. They're not rejecting the null. So they're not rejecting the null, they do not rejecting the null here, when the jobs is actually less than, that's the HA. So they do not reject when HA is, um, when H0 is false. So they do not reject when H0 is false. That's the type two error. B says, not to reject the null hypothesis that the percentage of adults who have jobs is 88% when the percentage is actually at least 88%. So they do not reject, and it is, H0 is true. That's a correct outcome. B says, they reject the null hypothesis that the percentage of adults who have, job, have jobs is 88% when the percentage is actually 88%. Uh-oh. So they reject it when H0 is true. That is type one. Letter D says, reject the null hypothesis that the percentage of adults who have jobs is 88% when that percentage is actually less than 88%. So they rejected when H0 is false. That is a correct outcome. So some of these concepts are a little trickier to understand, so I definitely recommend that you get started on your outlets. And then catch me back for there's a second video to lesson 8.1.